Hey guys, what is up? Niat here from Film Comics Explained. I uploaded like 8 videos last week, so it was necessary for me to take a day off yesterday to regain my sanity, and so I don't overdo it. <laughs> but we are back today with Volume 2 of Aliens. What did you guys think of the first chapter? I really liked it. Anyway, we pick up with Volume 2, and what we see is that the survivors have built a camp. There are quite a few of them still around, although their numbers are diminishing. What Russell tells us is that he noticed something in the distance fly above them. At first, he thought it was a hallucination, and the second time he saw it, he didn't have time to focus on it, as they were being attacked. After a few weeks, Russell was able to track it, and calculate the intervals between its appearances. He eventually built a net with the plans of catching it. And uh, about a month after he first saw it, he flung the net and managed to catch it. What he tells us is that it is artificial. At first, he thought he discovered a new piece of alien technology, but upon closer examination, he could see it was old Wayland Utani equipment. What he tells us is that as an engineer, he had retooled much of the company's technology and could see similarities in both. Russell is speculating whether it was a remnant of an unmanned survey mission from when the company was first scouting the system. This is very plausible and a reasonable deduction. But as he tampers with the device, he finds out that he was wrong. The device emits a strong light that projects the saved footage it had recorded. This is one of the pups that was released in the movie Prometheus. Russell arrives at the conclusion that not only were they not the first humans to set foot on LV-223, but they also weren't the first company employees. We noticed he hasn't divulged this discovery. Now, this is because the group has been preoccupied with what direction to take next. What we see is that there are two leaders that have begun to emerge from the group and they are both fighting for power. We have Kale who wants them all to fight back and hit the aliens on an offensive, while Jean is advising them to entrench and build their defences. Jean puts the argument forward that they are barely managing to hold it together and that to go after the aliens would be suicide. Kale informs the camp that his men had loaded food and supplies as well as the emergency beacon on board the Onager. All those things will ensure their survival and the beacon will get them a chance to be rescued. He's right for the most part, except he thinks there are only a few aliens, but we can see that the Onager is quickly becoming inundated with xenomorphs. What is also revealed to us is that this argument has been raging on between the two since they landed and doesn't look like it will be over soon. Some time has passed and the survivors have found edible flora and fauna in their short time on the moon. They are also eating the Xeno monkeys, which are described as tasting awful. <laughs> what Russell tells us is that they have stumbled upon the accelerant. He has noticed that anything that comes into contact with it would mutate, and due to this he has advised them all to steer clear. They are managing, but barely. The fish that they are catching on their side are okay, but the fish passed a natural bridge are something else. We know that this is the location of the awful sharks that will devour a portion of the crew in the Prometheus comic. As we proceed, we can see that they are always under constant attack. This time a few of them are ambushed while they are foraging for food. This is such a sad sight to see as these people are helpless. The best they can seem to do is run away whenever they are under attack. We know this to be an ineffective strategy, as the numbers of the aliens are going up while the survivors are diminishing. Russell is trying to motivate his friend Carl to run away as an alien creeps up on him. But we see that he is unable to do this as a xenomorph tears a chunk out of his neck. We are also informed that by this stage they had lost almost a third of the 38 people that had landed on LV-223. What he tells us is that at the rate they are dying, there won't be any of them left soon. We then get back to the camp, and we can see that the group is in a heated debate. The hunger and uncertainty has elevated tension. We have Jean and Kale going head to head. While they are both making their points, we can see that sides have been taken, and that while all of this was happening, Russell had essentially removed himself from the group, stating he had more important matters to consider. He tells us that he was able to access the probe's internal memory and rig it to project what it had recorded. What Russell uncovered was that those who were on this moon before them had found something interesting. The only problem was that they hadn't been around long enough to see it. What he notes was that although they had all but gone, 
the probe kept scanning and recording over the years and captured the transformation of the planet within a century. Once he had gathered all the information, he decided that it was finally time to tell the group what he had found. He informs them that the probe had been scanning for less than 50 years, and since then the moon had undergone millions of years of evolution. This is terraforming on a scale that they couldn't imagine. Now the only problem with this is that the group were not nearly as interested as he was. I mean, they have more important things to worry about. Sure, this is an incredible revelation, but it's hard to be excited when death is looming over you. After almost two months, we can see that they got better at surviving, and they began to understand their terrain better, which improved their ability to evade the aliens before things got out of hand. What we can see is that the group is heading towards higher ground. They are hiding in the treetops that are themselves at a high point on the mountain. They stick to the strategy of staying out of the way of the aliens. Uh, we can see that uh, almost three months have passed now. As the survivors are foraging for food, Russell is departing from the group, saying he's going to scout ahead. We have Jean telling him not to get lost, and Kale telling him not to get eaten. <laughs> As he looks ahead, Russell tells us that he misled them. He isn't scouting ahead. He is surveying the location of the other ships that belong to the engineers. The reason he didn't tell them was due to the fact that they would probably consider him crazy for not considering their survival as a priority. We see Russell enter the alien ship as he stumbles into a room that has a giant engineer head. Russell is in awe of what he is viewing. As he enters another part of the ship, he sees some strange alien equipment and wonders whether it was used to terraform. He also stumbles upon the bridge of the ship. Now, at this stage, he has explored the whole ship and sees that he was fortunate that this ship didn't have any eggs like the downed ship on LV-426. However, he found something else that took his breath away. What Russell has found is what he correctly assumes to be a hypersleep chamber. At first he wasn't 100% sure, but when he gets closer, puts his hand on it, and looks inside, he notices that it is still operational. He jumps back in surprise. Russell has set up his own camp in a cave where he's going over his work. Everything that he has scavenged, including the rover, is being stored here. Um, he has had to keep it on a leash as its instincts is to row away. <laughs> What Russell has also done is reprogram it to serve as a recording device. He is also on the edge of discovering something big. It's been a little over three months since they landed, and we have Kale and two men as they are attempting to do some fishing on a raft. And they are having a bit of a laugh here, saying that this beats being stuck down in a mine shaft all day as they are out in the sunshine. But what we can see is that they are venturing towards the natural bridge. Kale says this life isn't bad if you can avoid getting eaten. At this point their raft has drifted under the bridge, and one of them spots something under the rock face. Once they realise it's an alien, Kale orders them to move. The xenomorph leaps onto the raft and causes them to fall off. What we then see is one of them has made it to shore, with Kale right behind him. As Kale looks back, he sees that Louise has disappeared beneath the water. The xenomorph appears to be dragging him to his death. Uh, I personally think drowning is one of the worst ways to go, so if you compound that with the weight of the large alien crushing his spine, we know he is in a world of hurt. But this isn't the end of him. Kale returns to the camp, and Russell asks him what happened to Louise. Once he reveals that he was taken, Jean tries to whip everybody into working on the barricades immediately, but she is interrupted by Kale. They begin to have the same argument over again as Russell disappears into the distance. Now, he has removed himself from their world and is so fascinated by this moon. He wanted to know what made this place. He has surmised that it was designed to produce a breathable atmosphere, but is still trying to understand what was responsible for the genetic diversity and growth that is present. This is leading him into his exploration of the accelerant, which serves as the basis for Francis' actions to inject Eldon. He wonders what is next. It is at that moment that we see Louis spring out of the ocean. His DNA is bonded with the alien, and he has undergone a gruesome transformation. And that is the end of Volume 2. <laughs> I love this. Oh man, I had so much fun working on this one. Let me know what you think of the story in the comments below. Do you like it more than Prometheus? Or less? If not, let me know why. I'm curious to hear your opinions on that. With that in mind, 
that is all we have time for. I'm Niat with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.